Good evening. It's great to see everyone. We're all gathered here today to bid farewell and to honor our very dear friend, Rabbi Brzezanski, uh, who has touched so many lives in our community, who always says what's in his heart, who's been a spiritual leader to literally thousands of families across New Jersey, especially here in Teaneck, uh, and who has played such a critical role in building up our community. And I can tell you he has been a very, very good friend to me. By serving Congregation B'nai Yashurin now for more than a quarter of a century, Rabbi Brzezanski has made a real mark. And now this congregation is one of the most prominent Orthodox synagogues, I'd say, in the country. His service is far-reaching in so many different corners. As past president of the Rabbinical Council of Bergen County, a senior rabbinic fellow at the Coalition for Jewish Values, serving on the board of the Beth Din of America, and a longtime member of the Rabbinical Alliance of America, and so many other important organizations. Not to mention all his work as an attorney, a scholar, and always standing up for the U.S.-Israel relationship, which we all believe is so vital to America's national security. He has always continued to stand up for the Jewish community and to put the relationship of U.S. and Israel first. Politically, the rabbi and I, well, we may be far apart on some issues, as you all know. We've always come together on what's good for the 5th Congressional District and for our country. At different points in my own career in Congress, I've had the pleasure of sitting down with the rabbi uh, for important conversations. Uh, some of them are actually always, always tough, and the rabbi always fair to, always, always quick to share his uh, opinion on issues, always holding my feet to the fire as he should. We've talked about the U.S.-Israel relationship and uh, how we must move forward in a bipartisan way, something that obviously is incredibly important to me. I'm grateful for all his leadership and that I know he will continue to be an outspoken voice for the Alliance, but also for so many issues that are important to the 5th Congressional District, even when he's abroad. I'm sure that after more than 25 years at uh, Congregation Yashurim, Yashur, this farewell is bittersweet for all of you. I know that you'll be assuming Rabbi the title of Rabbi Emeritus and heading to Israel, and I look forward to seeing you continue to play a role in our community, even from afar, and I know you will. Rabbi, thank you so much for your leadership, for sharing the joys and the blessings of the Torah, for standing with so many families through very difficult times and through celebrations, for weddings and bar mitzvahs, and I know you've had your share of funerals as well. And you took us, helped take us through the COVID crisis and led spiritually as you always do. Thank you for, oh, for all of the relationships you've helped build and foster here in our community. To Karen, Robert Brzezinski's family, many of whom I know are coming together to honor him this evening and over the uh, weeks um, I just want to thank you for all the support you've provided throughout the years. I know the rabbi doesn't think of himself as a sentimental man, but I know he's going to miss the northern Jewish community, northern New Jersey Jewish community deeply and all the families who he's touched over the years. Rabbi, we thank you for everything you've shared with Teaneck, with North Jersey, and for everything you've done for every one of us. With leaders like you, always connected to North Jersey, I know that here in the greatest country in the world, our best days will always be ahead of us. So thank you again for all you've done. God bless you, God bless your family and the congregation, and God bless the United States of America. <laughs> So anybody that was in shul today listened to my yamod, and the rabbi said to me that it took him 26 years to get such a yamod. Um, so without further ado, there's so much to this be said about Rabbi Prusansky. Um So I'm going to limit the comments, uh, the intro. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Mor the Oscar Rabbi Stephen Prusansky. Thank you. What a well-oiled machine we're running here. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, uh, Chaim, thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Congressman Gottheimer for his kind words as well. And thank all of you for coming tonight. It's nice to see so many people back in shul, those watching at home will soon be watching at home. <laughs> you should all know that everyone here is masked and distanced. Just don't put the camera on them, all right? <laughs> now everyone is masked and distanced and following all the appropriate guidelines as they should. It's really nice to see people back in shul. I was thinking when I started in 1985 as a rabbi, so I'd come home after giving a shear and Karen would say to me, so how many attended? And I would say, yeah, 50, 60, 70. And she said, people? I said, no, toes. <laughs> used to count in terms of toes. So in terms of tonight, those people here tonight, and those watching at home, we're talking in the thousands of toes. And it's a tremendous tribute. I want to welcome uh, those who are here, Karen, and my daughter Tamar, and children Ari and Lauren, and I know my mother is watching with my brother and Amy and my children in Israel are up early, Ayel and Shmuley and Dean and Hillel and uh, watching as well. Hey, how are you? We'll see you soon. Um, I was walking out of shul a few weeks ago and uh, I think we're at the, uh, at that time it was maybe the sixth of the 12 farewells that were planned <laughs> and uh, David Levine said to me, you know, it reminds me of the old joke that the Gentiles leave without saying goodbye. Jews say goodbye without leaving. <laughs> and that's basically where we are now. I think there are another few farewells that are planned also until I'm uh, commandeered. One would think that I had an enormous amount of time to prepare this speech. The fact is, uh, time creeps up on you in many, many different ways. That's the reality of life as well. So a few days ago, I uh, decided to consult my family and closest advisors as to what I should say, you know, this momentous time. So Karen said to me, why don't you speak from the heart? And I thought for a few moments, and then I said, nah, it's not me. So the, the other day, I started uh, researching famous speeches for inspiration. And you know, the beginning of a speech has to capture people's attention. So I just drafted a few words that began like this. One score and six years ago, <laughs> Karen and I brought forth on this continent a new rabbinate, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. And that's where I stop, because that's where the problems begin. <laughs> that phrase, all men are created equal, you can't say it in America anymore. You can't even say it in modern orthodoxy anymore. So Lincoln is gone, and I had to move on. There was another opening that struck me as much better. It was Andrew Jackson's farewell address in 1837. None of you, I think, uh, heard it live. He said that being about to retire finally from public life, I beg leave to offer you my grateful thanks for the many proofs of kindness and confidence which I have received at your hands. And it's all true, except for the retirement part and the finally part. But what Jackson said at the time, in our language, is what Yaakov Avinu said at the beginning of Parshas V'yishlach. Katonti mikol ha-chasodim u-mikol ha-emes asher asiso es avdecho. I'm unworthy of all the kindnesses and the truth that you've shown your servant. And I say that to you, and it cannot be understated. Mikol ha-chasodim from all the kindnesses. At the top of the list, Karen, my children, my family, the rabbinate, like any public position, is something of a fishbowl, but they really thrived. And it would have been impossible but for your kindness and sensitivity. And apropos of that, I have to thank Karen and all my children, our children, for all their support and their love, and they can take justifiable pride in what was accomplished here. And whatever success we had, they take the lion's share of the credit. Now many of you know how over the years I've mocked the pledge of eternal love that uh, so many husbands in this position have made to their wives, all right? 
All right, I'll pledge eternal love if that's what it takes, but it's, it's really true, and I think you all know this as much as I do. There's nothing I could have done here or achieved here without Karen at my side as a partner. And many of you, justifiably so, like her far more than you like me. And I understand that also. But there's no doubt, it's not that she's just an integral part of the rabbinate, it's that I wouldn't be here but for her. And uh, I recognize that. And not in, you know, the, uh, the, the mealy mouth, meek way that most men standing here at a simple say about their wives. But I mean it is absolutely true, and I think people here know it as well. So thank you. Applause. <laughs> I want to thank also the people that I worked with over the years, uh, the office staff, and Alicia was here before, Galena is here tonight, and it's really been a pleasure. You know, I've had my entire life, even when I was a lawyer, only had women working in the office. Only men I ever worked with in the office were my father, the Shalom, and my brother, and that's it. But it's been an absolute delight to work with the entire staff in the office, to work with all the presidents of our shul and the boards of directors, the farewell committee. I mean, Chaim worked very hard on the event tonight. And I think it's part of the greatness of B'nai Yeshua and the volunteer spirit that exists, that people get involved. Not everyone always agrees with everything going on. That's the nature of life and Jewish life. But nonetheless, people's hearts are always there. So, katonti mikala hasadim. I feel small because of all the kindnesses. And mikala emet, from the truth as well. Churchill said once that the truth is incontrovertible. Malice may attack it, ignorance may deride it, but in the end, there it is. Said a different way, I've always had similar slogans on my desk, but the Rambam wrote that truth does not become more true because the entire world agree, agrees with it and doesn't become less true because the entire world disagrees with it. MS stands by itself. And I, you know, I'm not much of the Hasidic world, but Karen knows from the time I was a teenager, I was always drawn to Kutsk. And the search, the quest for truth of the Kutsk Rebbe as really, if not the ultimate value in Jewish life, at least the value that should be a cornerstone, a foundation of everyone's Zavas Hashem. And that's what I try to do as well, and try to transmit the truth as I see it. There's nothing that I've appreciated more than hearing that people don't always agree with you, but at least they respect it, and they learn from it, and they're challenged by it. Actually, there's one thing I have appreciated more than that, is people actually agreeing with me, that's a cycle. <laughs> but that to me is an essential <laughs> facet of the rabbinate, the ability to teach people the MS as the Rav sees it. When I started, I think Ari touched on this before in the questions, when I started, it was much more common than it is today. And I think it's a generational difference also. I grew up with rabbis, my father, Rabbi Wine, Rabbi Chait, my mentors among the elder rabbis in Kew Garden Sills, they were leaders without fear. And they knew where they wanted to go and weren't afraid to take charge. But in every case, it also required congregants that were amenable to it. And that's a very tender dance in life, in Jewish life especially, to be able to love truth and love peace and have them conjoined. It's not easy. It's very subtle. But you can have truth and you can have peace. They can coexist. Today, people I mentioned before are much more collegial, much more collaborative, dare I say, pluralistic. All points of view are equally valid. There's something to be gained from that. But there's much to be lost as well in terms of Torah and in terms of Avodah Hashem. And apropos of that, I quote from Harry Truman's farewell in 1953. And Truman said, and of course he came into office unexpectedly, I want all of you to realize how big a job, how hard a job it is, not for my sake, 
because I'm stepping out of it, but for the sake of my successor. He needs the understanding and the help of every citizen. That was Truman. Well, I never found it hard, to be honest with you. Maybe that's the, uh, the, the hard shell of my personality. It had its stressful moments, to be sure, but I always found it to be a joy. I can think there's not even one day that I came to shul and I found it a burden or overbearing or wished I was somewhere else. I would have liked to have left with a little more finality in the rabbinic su succession, but the world's been overturned in the last few months. You know, I offered to come back for the Yom Naram if it was deemed appropriate or necessary. But I have to tell you, I have the greatest confidence in Rabbi Zatz and Rabbi Weinberger going forward as well. Yeah, they're young, but in due time they'll outgrow that liability as well. But they're immensely talented, and they're infinitely caring, and they're enormously dedicated, and they'll be great. Just open your hearts to them. Open your minds to them. And whoever fills this role on a permanent basis down the road, the same thing applies. I was once their age also. And I was thinking the other day, when I came here, I was young. Relatively, I mean, but I've aged before you. In a real sense, I've grown up with many of you. Many of you here, many of you watching at home as well. We came here with four small children. And now our youngest, Ari, was five years old at the time. So now he has four children of his own. In a much more prosaic sense, I came here with a head full of dark hair and a face here with a dark beard, and I leave with a white beard and some stragglers on my head just <laughs> remaining behind for memory's sake. And always before my mind's eye, the cherished members of our shul that are no longer here, who shape the shul, but really shape my life as well. And of course, the Badel, the members who are still here, with whom I have such a fondness, such respect, such love for them, who make B'nai Yeshurun great, and will make it great in the future as well. I could reminisce about all the things that we did, changes, advances, successes, but I was thinking this morning, I really was successful at one thing, and that was decorum. The last month and a half, yeah. it's been a pleasure to Dauphin and Shul. All right, it took a coronavirus to do it, but now people come to Shul, everyone is masked, four amos apart, no one can talk. It's like a, a dream. That, and you can't tell when people are yawning when you're talking. It's beautiful, these masks. Even after the virus passes, we should keep it going. In Shul, we nurtured a deep bond with Israel, and I tried to show over many years that what happens there is not politics, but it's Torah, it's Jewish life, it's Jewish history, it's Jewish destiny. I'm so proud of all the olim from our shul, especially the children, some of whom I see regularly in Israel, some who have become very active in their Israeli shuls. I, there's many members, I would think of a dozen, young people grew up in the shul and became pulpit rabbis. And that to me is a great tribute as well. They weren't frightened from the job, but they learned something and decided to make it their own as well. But everyone has their reminiscences, it's true. Jefferson once wrote that I like the dreams of the future better than the history of the past. And there's something to be said for that as well. We all have our good and poignant and unforgettable memories. I have my own, I have with each and every one of you here, and we have them collectively as well from a shul. And perhaps the best way to say it, I paraphrase from Ronald Reagan's farewell in 1989. It's a paraphrase. It's been the honor of my life to be your rabbi. He said the president, but it's a different issue. <laughs> it's been the honor of my life to be your rabbi. And the fact is, parting is such sweet sorrow. The sweet part is Israel 
and Aliyah, and the sorrow, the goodbyes, of course, and leaving this beautiful shul and community. Ramam writes in Hilchas Tfilo, Laolam Yashkim Odom Viyariv Leves Akneses, Shaint Filosun Ishmas Bechol Eis, Ela Beves Akneses. A person should always come in the morning and in the evening to shul, because a tefillah is only always heard in a Beis HaKnesses, in shul. What is a shul? It's the place to which we go to seek Hashem. And the Ram continues, U mitzvah l'arutz l'Beis HaKnesses. It's a mitzvah to run to shul. Shenemar v'neida nirdafoladas es Hashem. We should run. We should know that we should run. We should be eager to know God and what He wants from us. And that's what we find in Shul. That's a Shul. I hope and pray that I was up to the task. You know, when all is said and done, all's been said and all's been done. I mentioned this morning, and I only repeat it now, this morning I spoke about the paradox of lo lacham l'choligmar, which can't finish everything. That's not what human life is like. V'lo atta ben choli batel mimeno. But nor are you free to desist from it. The paradox. I leave with some satisfaction, but enormous gratitude for the opportunity that you all granted me, for the Torah that we learned together, for the time that we spent, the years, the decades that we spent together, for the special kahila that we built, for what I gained from each of you, for the wonderful relationships that nurtured and sustained me, for the friendships that Karen and I will always cherish, for the loving cocoon of Bnei Yishurun in which we were able to raise our children, for all the good that we did in the community and in the world, and for the passionate connection that we formed with the people in the land of Israel. As I say to you, So you're not free to desist from that, from any of that. And the months and the year ahead will be challenging for all shuls, because life is uncertain. No one really knows what the future holds, short term, long term. No one knows. But no one can be mavate. No one should take the shul for granted. No one should think that things just naturally bounce back because that's teva, that's nature. It's not true. It's going to take a concerted effort and leadership and dedication from everyone, from each person doing his or her part. In one of the most famous farewell addresses, Washington at uh, Francis Tavern, he took leave of his troops in 1783, he said it the best. With a heart full of love and gratitude, I now take leave of you. Actually, he came back six years later as president, but that's a separate point. All that is left is to share that love and their gratitude and to thank you all. Karen and our children, and grandchildren, my dear friends, for this opportunity of a lifetime and for your support. And thank HaKadosh Baruch Hu for the opportunity and for the strength to carry on all these years. There's such an interesting machlokas at the end of the first parak of Arachin. Gemara debates whether dor lefi parnos, parnos lefi dor. Does the generation get the leader it deserves or does the leader get the generation it deserves? Suffice it to say, what every shul needs is a good shidduch. And I always thought this was a good shidduch. We say in the prelude to the benching at a Sheva Brachos, may Hashem always she'ei birkas b'nei yishurun. Heed, listen to the blessings of b'nei yishurun, and may Hashem shower everyone with blessings as well, it should be good in God's eyes to bless the people of Israel and our wonderful Kehila here at all times, in every hour, with your peace. And may we together all merit living in Israel 
and welcoming Mashiach Tzidkenu b'mhera b'yameinu. Amen. I thank you again for coming and Shavua Tov, and now I think something else is going to happen. Thank you all. This is a message from Congregation B'nai Yeshurun. The tribute video in honor of Rabbi Stephen and Karen Przanski will begin now. As a child, he was interested in history. He knew all the presidents of the United States, all their statistics. He knew baseball cards, baseball plays, and all their statistics. He was very interested in, in statistics, but I don't think that was an indication of him becoming a rabbi. And here I am in BMT, and a number of years later, not that many, the 70s, uh, once again, a Przanski shows up, Steve Przanski, and uh, we hit it off right away. To me, he was not Steve, he was not Przanski, he was the Prus, which was a reminder of Pras, uh, an award, top quality. We bonded together because uh, the message of Eretz Yisrael, La, La Am Yisrael, La Pitorat Yisrael, motivated and pulsated within my body and within Steve as well. Thinking back early on, when Stephen graduated law school and he became a lawyer, he was then also a part-time rabbi. But I thought that was just panosa because he was married to Karen and he needed to have an income and he was uh, doing the part-time rabbi thing. But Many times when my husband would come into the office and when Stephen should have been looking at his uh, law notes for a trial the next day, he was in fact looking into sperm and learning. So that may have put uh, an idea in the back of our minds that maybe law wasn't the profession Stephen really wanted. I was head of the search committee with Eliezer Stavsky and Rabbi Frzanski came to my house and we were going to go meet the committee. and. Uh, the rabbi knocks on the door and I say, hello, Rabbi Przanski. He says, hello. He says, you know, I don't have a black hat. I said, what do you mean? He said, my hat got stolen. I work in the Bronx in the courthouse and they broke into my car and stole my hat. And I said, okay, I don't think I've ever heard that one, but we'll go meet the committee without the black hat. Rabbi, after 26 years of seeing your hat collection, I can't believe someone would steal your black hat. They made it tonight that he had to leave law, full-time rabbinate, they would pay him a full-time salary, but it had to be a full-time rabbinate. And he took a congregation that was on the map already, but wow, he really put it on the map. I was president of wherever Brzezanski started. Uh, we were uh, welcoming a new rabbi, as well as uh, building a new building. Uh, challenging times. Um, for both. Uh, Rabbi Przanski helped on the fundraising effort for the building. Um, and then I can recall that uh, one time Rabbi Przanski spoke to me and said he was going to uh, Washington to uh, protest some aspect of the Oslo Accords. And uh, all I could say to him was that, do me a favor, just, uh, just don't chain yourself to anything because we really don't have the funds to, uh, to bail you out. I want to wish Mazel Tov to my parents on this incredible milestone. From the time I was little, I knew that my father had dreams. And one of those dreams was to be the rabbi of a big shul. And another one of those dreams was to live in Israel. And it's inspiring to know that um, you set your sights on something and you can make them happen. 
Uh, my mother's dream has always been to just be happy wherever she is, which is inspiring in its own way. And um, I'm really, really fortunate to have them as role models for so many things in life. Growing up as the rabbi's daughter was really wonderful. I got all the benefits of, of having my father as this um, prominent figure to some, but never felt any of the pressure that often comes associated with it. My parents let me pretty much do what I want, act the way I want, sometimes dress how I wanted. Um, I really felt a sense of freedom that I know a lot of other people who grow up in a rabbinic family don't feel. So listening to all these uh, rabbinic prabhas, one question that keeps being asked at the Q&A session is, what do you plan to do to maintain a normal life for your children and your family? And I think, honestly, and I don't know if my siblings would agree, but I think my parents can write the book on what it's like to, to raise and maintain healthy and normal children, at least healthy and normal sons. I think the jury's still out on my sisters. Um, but I think that the, the, the number one thing that they would say, and I think has been true, is just really making, making your family a priority. And in that realm, I think when I view my parents, I don't necessarily view them as the rabbi and rabbis in the shul, because they, they, that's never how they made themselves appear. They never missed a game of mine, they never missed a, a baseball game, a hockey game. Actually, my father, not only would he come to the hockey games, there were a few times where he, um, he wasn't even asked, but he started being the person on the buzzer until uh, he had a little trigger happy every so, you know, he would just be sounding the buzzer at every free moment. And then he wasn't, at, he wasn't asked back to be the buzzer, but he'd still come, uh, he'd still come back to be the game. There was one game, actually, we were playing against um, SAR. Steve Fox's son was on the team. Uh, the person who was broadcasting said, it's really getting out of hand in this stadium. A prominent rabbi in the area actually ran onto the, ran onto the court in the middle, in between periods, and gave the refs a piece of his mind. I knew it wasn't anybody else. It had to have been my father. My parents were always very giving of their time to the shul, yet as children, we never felt deprived at all. My parents always made us their top priority. For example, I remember Shabbos lunch, for example. My father never wanted us to eat out at a friend. He would always be very upset. If we wanted to go to a friend, he made sure that that was our special time as a family. Sundays were always very, very busy for my parents, and my mother, I guess she felt bad about it, so she always made sure that we had phone numbers of every takeout place, and we were always able to take out food. The Ramam says in uh, Hilchos Tshuva that the path to Tshuva requires that you change your name. So when I joined this family, my name was Ari, but somehow it got changed to Ari G, and then all of a sudden, REG was too hard, so it got changed to G. And I told my father-in-law that I didn't appreciate being, calling G, being called G. So it got transitioned to the artist formerly known as G. And finally, my new name is AFCAG, as short for the artist formerly known as G. So thanks to my father-in-law, now I'm on the path to a new life. Thank you. Grandma and Zadie, our kids love you so much. They love coming to the house and no matter what's going on in your busy lives, you always make the time for our kids and you make them feel special. Um, they particularly enjoy Zadie time and Grandma, you're always available to help out and to babysit and every, we all love you. What's it like having a prolific author of a father of four books available at all reputable bookstores? What's it like having a father who's an author of a renowned blog with advertisement space available for purchase on rabbiperzanski.com? It'd be much better if you purchased his books. I think a lot of my, my parents work in B'nai Sharon has been to be there for people for all their questions, helping people clarify things, whether it's philosophical or emotional. I don't think that there is any other role of a rabbi maybe that is more significant than that. Several years ago, when Rabbi Hrzansky's name came up in conversation with my father-in-law, Rabbi Harlap, he stopped for a moment and said, Rabbi Hrzansky, he is the most courageous rabbi in America today. I had the pleasure of having Rabbi Stephen Hrzansky grow up in our shul, Beis Torah in Muncie, Suffer New York, and uh, he was there for many years. 
And uh, we knew from the beginning that uh, Stephen Przanski was going to be a name in the Jewish world and that he really was going to not only accomplish great things for himself personally, but that he would be a great asset for the Jewish people, for Torah, and for the land of Israel. It takes someone who is in the administration of the shul to realize the responsibilities that are, that are given to the rabbi and his family, and certainly Rabbi Przanski and Karen have fit the bill. Not only have they taken on their shoulders the overall image of B'nai Yashurin and leading the shul and so on, but during their long tenure here, they also took care of the personal problems of many of our kehila. It's been a singular honor to be able to serve this wonderful kehila alongside Rabbi Przanski for more than a decade. When I initially was offered the position here, somebody reached out from the shul and said to me, make sure you pay attention because Rabbi Przanski is a master at his trade, a master of, and make sure you learn from him. And I think and I hope that I've taken advantage of that opportunity to watch and to grow and to see and to use those lessons in order to forge my own path in Rabbanus, but one that's very, very much has been influenced by what Rabbi Przanski has said, what he has done, and what he has taught me. Uh, the rabbi, uh, in conjunction with the administration when I was the president, was very, very instrumental in starting uh, multiple minyanim, both in the morning and in the afternoon. He was also uh, very helpful in helping set up the young uh, couples minyan, which to this day is a thriving minyan. A few years back, when uh, I was interviewing for the rabbinic interim position of B'nai Asherin, uh, so Rabbi Brzezanski, I didn't know it was going to be a whole process, but he told me that there was going to be an interview involved. So uh, we met up, I sat down, I was a little bit nervous. Uh, it was all of one question. He asked me at the time who my posik was. So I said I had a certain Rebbe in NYU that I would ask my Shilas to, my grandfather at the time, my grandfather at the time I would ask my Shilas to. And he was like, wrong. Now it's me. And that was it. So I got my one question wrong. But I accepted the rabbi as my posik, and with that, he gave me the rabbinic internship position. The central message that the best possible life that a person can live, and the best possible life for a Jew, is the learning of Torah, the keeping of mitzvos. It's an idea that Rabbi Brzezinski repeats again and again in his shirim, in his classes, in his drushos, that a Torah lifestyle and the learning of Torah and that type of way that Hashem demands of us and expects of us is the best way to live your life. I think it's well known that Robert Brzezinski is somebody who has very strong opinions on many, many issues, and he's certainly not afraid to express and share and defend those opinions. Um, I actually agree with a lot of his opinions, although not everything. I've defended him sometimes in print and in, uh, uh, verbally. But I respect, even if I disagree with him, the fact that he has the courage of, of his convictions to stand up strongly for what he believes in, even though it may not always be the popular position. ליבי במזרח ואני בסוף מערב. הוא תמיד היה עם הלב, עם המוח בארץ ישראל. זה גם מה שהוא לימד את הקהילה. וזה לא סותר את מסירות הנפש. דווקא מתוך קשר <coughs> לארץ ישראל אפשר ללמד תורה. I had the pleasure of serving with Rabbi Przanski as a colleague and also being his congregant. And I am impressed, as everybody who knows him is impressed, by his great skill set. He has tremendous oratory talents. He writes so beautifully. But most importantly is his passion for all things important, for Torah, for the land of Israel, and for the people of Israel. I want to thank you for always coming to visit the teens and doing our question answers, which are real highlights and very memorable for all of the youth of our shul. They get a glimpse into how a clear, well thought out mind operates on the spot with the pressure of being, having questions directed right at you. Uh, he also uh, started his uh, Jewish history lecture series on weeknights, which was very well attended and very well received from a tape perspective as well. Uh, his shiurim were expanded significantly to this day. 
Over the past 20 years, I've had the opportunity to work together with Rav Przyansky. It has been a zchus to be able to watch him in terms of his role in Bnei Yishurun, in the Greater Bergen County community, and ultimately his involvement in all of Klal Yisrael. Rambam tells us uh, in Perik Vav of Hilchot Deyot that Rov Maasei Bnei Adam, the majority actions of a person during the course of his lifetime, is Nimshach Achareya Vechaveirav, simply follows the example of his friends and his colleagues. I hope that your uh, decision to make Aliyah will serve as the impetus for your other Chaveirim on the RCBC and the broader rabbinic community to follow in your footsteps and be Mikhaim the Mitzvah of Yishuv Eretz Yisrael. I answered his phone call when I accepted the position at Ketet Torah with great excitement. Reverend Przansky warmly welcomed me into the community and he added a note that he had eight families from B'nai Yeshurun that he would like to send to me at Ketet Torah. Hopefully I'll have the opportunity to reciprocate to his successor. For the last 10 years since we moved to Teaneck, I've had the blessing of learning from Rabbi Przansky. Rabbi Przansky, whether it's the law and the law, whether it's the presidents and the Jews, whether it's the centurions, when he presents material, well, first of all, he puts four hours into one hour. Secondly, he's not just giving you facts, he gives you analysis. He challenges you, he challenges your assumptions. When I have a chance to learn from him, when he's giving a drasha, or he's giving a class, or just going to him with ideas. In my personal life, in learning, having a chance to ask him how he sees the world, He's one of the most stimulating, challenging people that I know. I know the rabbi just started, but are you sure he said that? What? You're talking about the rabbi? He said what? He said what? He wrote what? Really? He said what? He wrote what? He blogged what? Don't worry, I'll, I'll speak with him. As you know, I'll look into it. Don't worry. Let me check it out. I don't believe it. Let me check it out. I'll call you right back. All right, you know what? Let me just check this out before we come to any conclusions. I'll look into it a little bit more, and I'll get back to you. Give me a day or two to look into this. Um, stay calm for now, and we'll touch base in a couple of days. Let me look into it. There's got to be some explanation. Gee, after this phone call, there's one thing we need to do. Yeah, Karen, thank God I don't have to listen to these people anymore. Raprozansky calls himself a Kalta Litvak, but I could tell you uh, I experienced something very different uh, this past Yom Kippur after uh, he concluded with uh, Nila and Davin for us for uh, Nila. I could tell you that uh, he broke down, uh, he kept hugging people, uh, didn't let people go, and it was a side of him that uh, is not real evident all the time, but it was just genuine, uh, wishing the congregation well, knowing that this was the last deal that he was gonna be doing for us. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to extend the uh, hearty mazel tov to uh, Karen and Stephen uh, upon this wonderful uh, occasion of completing so many years of dedicated service to our community and particularly to B'nai Yishurun. Now that he himself is going to live in the land of Israel, he'll be able to continue his great work on behalf of Torah and the Jewish people in the land of Israel. And I wish him all success and blessings. On behalf of my wife and myself, we'd both like to wish Rabbi and Mrs. Prusansky much continued success in all their endeavors and continued nachas from their family. I just want to wish you guys a good trip to Israel and hopefully your book sales, Abba, go really well so that Tamar and I can officially move to Israel soon. <laughs> what a treat it has been working as a Gabay Rishon under Rabbi Pizansky all these years. Watching you lead by example for me and to all the congregants. You have inspired so many people with your wisdom and knowledge. You and Karen 
have made this shul an amazing place to die. Rabbi and Karen, I want to take this opportunity to thank you both for your many years of service to our shul and our community. And I wish you both bracha ve'atzlacha in this very new, beautiful, and exciting time of your lives. On behalf of Michal and myself, we just want to extend the mazel tov to the Przanskis. It's been such an honor to be together with you in the community for so long and to watch you fulfill your dream of making Aliyah. To Rabbi Przansky and to Karen, we wish you success. We look forward to seeing you soon on our visits to Modi'in. Higi Azman, Bezrat Hashem, Shiyavo, Larsen, Rabitusha, Baruch Haba, Bishem Hashem. My wish is that his, 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 his moving to Eretz Yisrael should be a bracha and a Kiddush Hashem through his Arbatzah's Torah, just like his, just like his, a buzz store in America. I like to sit next to Zadie and Shuo. And yeah, I wish you a great time moving to Israel. Rabbi and Karen, I just want to thank you for everything. You mean so much to me and my family. I was a young man when uh, you guys took over, and thank God it's, you know, it's been a wonderful 26 years. Rabbi and uh, Karen, thank you very much for all the uh, years of leadership and comfort and guidance that you have provided, not only to Lonnie and I and our children, but to the entire B'nai Yashurin family. We're so excited for Grandma and Zadie to move to Israel. I'm really gonna miss you here, and I hope you have a good time in Israel. I love you, Grandma and Zadie. We are going to miss him, but I'm sure he will represent us in the Knesset. Uh, I wish you much success on this next stage, uh, making Aliyah, and I, I hope to keep in touch. Mommy and Abba, we can't wait for you to fulfill your dream of making Aliyah, and Ooh. we can't wait to greet you in Israel. Mazel Tov, Rabbi Krasansky and Karen, we will miss you. Love you, Grandma Zadie, and you, Grandma Zadie. יש צרות, דאגות, החיוך נעלם אחר תראה רק שחור כי גם זה יעבור והכל יסתדר כי השם יעזור יש תקווה, נשאיר כולנו יחד יש אמונה חזקה מכל הפחד לא ניפול, לא נירד כי אנחנו לא לבד יש לנו השם Yeah, I know.
So I would like to, on behalf of the shul of CBY, to give a, a gift certificate of gratitude and love. B'nai Yishur is proud to present both of you with a gift certificate for a painting for your home in Israel. We are hoping that whatever you pick out, it will have prominent place in your home. It is our hope that when you look at the painting, it will bring fond memories and nachas of your time with us as you both led B'nai Yishur, giving all of our B'nai Yishur and family your utmost guidance, knowledge, caring, love, and support. To both of you, with our full hearts and our karsato, we gift you a certificate of gratitude and love, and we will have the painting for you as well. And also regarding to the rabbi's book, we will be having it very shortly. Again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all Thank very you. much.
Good night. Thank you all for watching.